Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of The Daily Film Show. I'm your host, Nicholas Weimer, and today I'm joined by two of my most uh, intelligent and illustrious guests, um, the first being uh, Mr. Longboy Liberty himself, Gabriel Krauser. Gabriel, how are you today? Very good, Nick. How's it? And on the show again, uh, our CEO, Franz Crenier, Dr. Franz Crenier. Franz, how are you today? No, I enjoyed it so much yesterday. I even threw my microphone around that I've come back <laughs> to do another day. Excellent. This time it's so stapled we... to the table, hopefully. <laughs> well, I, I used to have my camera fall off the pile of books it was balanced on. Luckily, I've got a tripod now, but anyway. Um, right, so yesterday we did talk a little bit about the budget, but the focus of yesterday's show was, was uh, on, on the future rather than the now. Um, so today we're going to be focusing on the budget that uh, Finance Minister Tito Mbueni delivered yesterday. So I think as a way of introduction, I'm just going to start off by talking about uh, kind of the media headlines and the general impression one might get if you read the news as to how this thing uh, would, is being received. Um, budgets 2021 spend on land reform, post-settlement support welcomed. Informal traders welcome 4 billion rand budget allocation for rural township enterprises. Uh, few cheers as sin taxes set to increase. Kosatu slates Mbueni budget as disconnected from reality and pro-business. Mbueni walks the talk on pledge to halt bailouts to troubled SOEs. And then a collection of reactions from mostly social media. Um, it was a quote from Gavin Davis, the DA uh, MP, how are people supposed to survive? Um, and then there were some other reactions as well, including from the EFF, who said that it was not going to result in any structural reforms of the economy. So my question, I guess, to you, France, um, and you, you perhaps gave away a bit of what you're going to say uh, yesterday, but uh, is this budget disconnected from reality and pro-business? Well, you'd, you'd think so, listening to business. You've missed them. I read a lot of their stuff, and it's wonderful. I mean, I forget which. I'm going to name the wrong institutions. Eight and a half out of ten from one bank economist, the seven out of ten, a balancing act, a fine effort reigning in the debt uh, is, is what you're getting out of business. And... Um, that's peculiar because it doesn't feel that way if you live in the country, that, that some uh, very brilliant uh, uh, financial and economic balancing act has been struck. Actually, this time, it's but for the wrong reasons. It's the Kusatus and the EFFs and the Twitters that have it right. And the, 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 the mainstream financial institution responses is just the usual political appeasement. It's a bad position, Nick, we're in. Um, firstly, I'll say a few things, and then because there's so many. And I'll say a few, and then we'll talk about them. One is South Africans have never been taxed as heavily as they're taxed now. Never in the history of the country has this happened. And we know this because you can calculate it. And one of the things you calculate is tax that the government takes divided as a share of the size of the economy. And that figure has risen, risen over the years now by about 30% to a record all-time high point. So if you feel that it's worse than it's ever been, it's because it is worse than it's ever been. That's one thing. The second thing is that despite that rising burden of taxation, the hole that the government in, is in has only been deeper on three occasions, the First and Second World Wars, and when apartheid collapsed after 50 years of its contradictions. Third thing to say about the budget is, is if you draw a graph of it, it's very nice. The minister said basically, don't worry about this. It's all fine. What we're going to do is we're going to raise revenue a little bit more over the years ahead, and we're going to bring down our expenditure. And when you do that, you kind of close the crocodile's mouth, and everything will be fine, and 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 debt levels will moderate, and this is what, what the sort of gushing bank economists were going on about yesterday. It's not going to happen. And it's not going to happen for two reasons. Firstly, they're not going to raise revenues by as much as they want. And that's not just a guess. For 10 years, Nick, the Treasury's growth forecast, the number the minister quotes in his speech, the speech of yesterday, has proven to be about 50% out relative to the actual performance of the economy. 
And the reason for that is not that the minister was taken by surprise or that he doesn't understand the forecasting, very clever chaps. It's actually that they just mislead the public by talking up the economy and the full knowledge that the policies necessary to bring about a growth recovery are, are not in place. Second reason is that cutting expenditure is a hard thing to do. You can do that as was done yesterday by providing below inflationary uh, grant increases. You can do a bit of it. But you can't go very far as the ANC. And the reason for that is that the party is fundamentally an institution now built around, it's, it's a corrupt enterprise, a fundamentally corrupt enterprise. And it holds together as long as the members of this enterprise continue accessing cash through the state. As soon as you cut off the cash flow, which austerity would do, you will trigger tremendous infighting in the party that I think will probably bring it down. So that's not, they're not going to grow. They're not going to cut expenditure. And the, the, all the economists buy into this. I mean, the, the not the independent ones. They, they were very good yesterday. The other ones all buy into this and say it's all going to come right two years down the line. It's not going to be the case. What's also missed, and then I do stop, is, is, is it's very cleverly planted by government, this idea that the government has been benevolent in this budget that tax increases are, are not there. In fact, uh, you know, corporate tax cut by 27 to 28%, the uh, 28 to 27%, the idea a uh, bracket creep was, was slowed somewhat, et cetera, et cetera. It's very misleading. Because the tax to GDP tag that I spoke about earlier has reached such a very high point, Tax increases coming through the system now are happening outside of the confines of SARS. So a good example of that is Eskom, which increases its electricity fees by much a greater rate than the growth rate of the economy or even the inflation rate. And it does that because it needs to raise the revenue to keep going. And if it didn't do that, it would need more tax bailouts from taxpayers. So you're just being taxed that way around. The same is true with the petrol price. I can't remember what it is, 30%, 40% of the petrol price is actually a tax. So when you, you calculate your tax burden, this is how you do it. And I did that earlier uh, yesterday evening with some colleagues again this morning. Do this. Take your income tax that you pay on your income. Let's say maybe it's 30%. If you're in the top bracket, it's higher than that, much higher. Add what you pay in rates and levies and, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, uh, add all the secondary taxes that you pay, so in the petrol price and, and the like, and then add what you have to pay for your own security, healthcare, education, because the government doesn't provide proper services. Comfortably, you will find that most families in South Africa are paying more than 60% of what they earn in, in tax. And uh, uh, they're getting fed up, and with good reason. And um, there might be a, a light at the end of this tunnel that's not a train on coming. And that, that is that the faster the government doubles down on its, on, its, on its ridiculously harmful policies, the faster it is running out of the money that it needs to stay in power. So citizens in this equation, I don't think are as underpowered as they sometimes think they are organized properly they can turn the tables on the government and they can do it through the through the deficit problem that's it nick from me thanks so gabriel uh, i want to get your thoughts now and um let's start off is there anything that you think france missed in that in his analysis there um and also uh it, i've heard it said uh, that you are a connoisseur of, of of vice so what are your thoughts on on the the syntax in particular yeah, no, I don't think, I think France hit all the major points. I, I'm i also a connoisseur of the Soviet Union and Russian history. Uh, I think it's worth remembering a brief anecdote about the Cambridge Four, where British intelligence was looking, they realized there was a mole, someone was leaking information to the Soviet Union from the British uh, secret services, and they looked for the mole, and they looked for the mole, and eventually they found out the mole was the person in charge of the Secret Service and his three deputies. Now, the feeling that one gets from hearing that anecdote is maybe a little bit like the feeling that I got from watching the response to the budget speech. And it's important to remember how the Soviets managed to make that happen. And the, and the metaphor of the day was chicken feed. You feed them chicken feed, you feed them chicken feed, and in exchange, 
you get the really important information. So the Soviet Union would feed bits of useful, positive information for the British Secret Service to use. And that's how you lure them in. That's how you get them on side. And, uh, and then you get the information going the other way and you, and you rip their eyeballs out. This feels a lot like the, the media's response, right? They get fed this chicken feed. They get fed these small little bits of good news. And instead of looking at them in the broader context that France has provided, the government revenue to GDP ratio, and even worse, the government expenditure to GDP ratio, because the difference, the budget deficit, is what you're going to be taxed even more on down the line. Instead of looking at that broader context, instead of looking at the broader context of promises that Mboweni makes that have already been made and not been delivered upon, you get this uh, sort of cringing cap in hand. Oh, thank you, sir. You, you gave me two peanuts and a, and a, and a millicorn. Uh, that's very delicious. Much appreciated. So I think that I think it, we do well to beware of what's going on. If I can add just a couple of numbers, if you look at where... Uh, if you look past the speech and you look at the actual budget document, which is always published at the same time on parliament.gov, you see the, the real numbers for the medium term that uh, the Treasury is looking at. And the biggest cuts, there are no real cuts, but there are slows in expenditure down uh, the, the ratio and the actual expenditure compared to what it was planned to be. The biggest single cut in that sense is to public education. 120 billion rand less than had previously been budgeted over the next three years. The second biggest cut is safety and security, 80 billion rand less than had been previously budgeted over the next three years. So if you look at the priorities of ordinary South Africans based on institute uh, statistical analysis, the last thing we want is, uh, is education to be withered away. The last thing we want is for the police to be getting less money. Now, I don't think it's impossible to pull off cuts like that and at the same time grow the actual outreach of police and uh, public schooling. You could do that. The voucher program that the Institute recommends uh, could be cheaper and better than what we currently have. If you had uh, more accountable police services, they could be cheaper and more effective than we really have. Uh, but the point that I'm trying to align is, firstly, we're not seeing any of those real policy reforms. And secondly, where the money is being pulled back it's, uh, it's, it's totally out of joint with what South Africans' priorities are. We'd much rather, I think, see a withdrawal in uh, expended expenditure, expected in expenditure on the, the kinds of uh, patronage network pipelines that uh, France was speaking about there. Now, that's exactly right, uh, Gabriel. That stuff's left untouched. And here we've got to say a harsh thing that this kind of free ride Tito Mboweni gets is not well-deserved at all. I had a journalist this morning, we are talking about this, hit me, well, well, you guys are a bit critical of him. What, what should he have done? And I said, well, a great many things. The firstly is that the checks that get signed, that fall into the hands of the corrupt politicians, he knows exactly who those people are, because they're his colleagues in the cabinet. They sit in his party. And still those checks go through and those patronage networks are financed. So number one, I said, put an end to the preferential procurement stuff because it's prioritizing those payments, here's the truth, over the spending on education of children. That is what he signed off in that budget yesterday. That's what he did. And he's the good guy. It's not, it's not, it's not properly deserved at all, that kind of accolade. Social grants which are paid to poor people and we think are important because they help them live a bit better. How could you say they must be taken away? Social grants were increased at a rate below inflation, and that's below CPI. But for poor people, that's much worse because their inflation rate is actually much higher than CPI because they spend their meager income on high inflationary items for transport and fuel and food and that sort of thing. So here, here's a government actually taking a decision. Tito Mboweni is standing there, is applauded by his party colleagues and by banks and economists. So we're actually going to make you poorer this time around because our economy is growing too slowly to, to keep you where you were. And it's growing too slowly because of all our uh, BE and expropriation policies. But those are actually the things that are important to us. So screw you. You can get poorer. And we kind of have a good sense the media are too dumb to figure this out, which, I mean, they kind of got it, but they haven't tied the fact that grants are lower 
because the government is pursuing expropriation. That, that's the next step to take. So a part of the analysis here is not just to soft soap the whole thing, which is ridiculous given the fiscal hole the, current, the country's in, but also to make the point about Mbaweni, that he plays this chef with his pilchards and his avocados. He's such a nice guy. He's doing his best. Him and Cyril are doing everything they can to save the country. It's actually a lot of nonsense. He is an enabler of this problem as much as anyone else in that party and the government that he's part of. And you saw that again yesterday, even if it was dressed up as, 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 as common sense and, and, and sensible policy and doing his best. It's none of, nothing of the sort. And if you dispute that, go ask some poor chap who lives in a shack on a sand dune if he thinks his life's going to get better after hearing the budget. Because it's his opinion that actually counts for far more than Imbawenis or the ANCs or a a bunch of analysts such as ourselves talking on YouTube. Nick. So I guess one of the questions I have then is if, you know, for example, grants are being uh, you know, increased by below inflation amounts, are there going to be immediate political consequences for the ANC before uh, it comes time to vote? They're already there. We've seen them, that material circumstances of people in ANC support. It's, it's been the 20-year trend. Ten years, life got better, ANC got stronger, life got worse, ANC got weaker. Next 10 years, I don't know so much anymore because the newer polling, that's very few data points because it's new. I think I'm starting to see in the data that desperate people, uh, support is starting to become sticky for the ANC. And what I think has happened and is going to happen, and if I'm right, it's a very big problem, is that Politics was driven for the ANC by aspiration since 94. After 94, it met people's aspirations. They had people with aspirations, and therefore that was rewarded. And after 2007, uh, when, when, when the changes happened at Polokwane and life got worse, people had their aspirations dashed. So they punished the ANC. What's now happening, and it's accelerated by this lockdown, is that there's such a level of plain desperation amongst the poor. You know, you don't have enough food to eat. You live in a hole in the ground. It really is terrible. That you don't even have the luxury of an aspiration. All you want is a meal to get through the day. And then if the government comes along and gives you a grant, you know, whether it's more or less, if you've got no prospect of getting a job, you can't aspire to a job, you're not going to get one. You begin to know that then ANC support might become start to become sticky amongst desperately poor people, and the party can use poverty and deepening poverty to entrench themselves in power for a bit longer, not very much longer, but a bit longer. Now, I don't know if this is what will happen, but the early little polls that, 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 we, that I've seen of, of data of a few weeks old makes me think that this should be raised with people. Nick. Gabriel, I guess uh, another question that people may have is why is business just so, uh, as, as Franz pointed out, a lot of, you know, the big financial institutions are very nice about Mbueni and everything. Why, why are they so captivated uh, by the idea of Cyril and Tito, even as reality has revealed that this is not the reforms that were promised? <clears throat> I don't think any one answer is going to do it, but... Uh, reflecting on a couple of conversations I've had with uh, some of South Africa's uh, richest uh, CEOs. Uh, in private, uh, some are prepared to admit through long teeth that this is actually a comfortable place to do business. There's so much red tape. There's so much regulation. There's so much pulling down new potential entrants to marketplaces and those that are already there to grow that if you are an established big business, you, you, you can feel very comfortable. The pie shrinks, but the, but the oaks at the front of the line getting, getting their teeth knocked in, so to speak, are small and medium businesses, are uh, you know, upcoming types and, and people trying to get in from the outside. This is, uh, the, the fe one fear is if you make this a genuinely competitive marketplace, are you sitting on an establishment that's become so lethargic and complacent that you'll lose market share even in an economy that's doing well? Now, that's a business-oriented perspective. You can look in the same way 
at a, a middle upper middle class perspective. I know guys who who are successful consultants and successful import exporters, successful wheeler dealers, millionaires sending their kids to private schools, and they know that they they've been in a lost decade and they've been knowing this. They know that there's no growth. So, so the only way to make money is to is to hook your pipe into one of the flows and extract from that. But they've become so used to it that they worry. If you, you pull away the regulations, if you pull away BEE, black or white, the guys who figured out how to make that system work, and you and you turn the South African economy from this horizontal redistribution thing into an actual growth thing, are you going to be the one who gets left behind? In other words, I you know, there's a silly old line, but 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 uh, the prison that's the most dangerous is the one in your mind. It's actually true. I think a lot of people that are in the upper middle class, that are in big business, are prisoners of their own low expectations. They're, they're prisoners of the of the very sort of background ideological structure that they've been operating in and succeeding in for uh, several years. So that's one side of it. Another side of it is straight out fear. If you are the head of a uh, mining industry, a, a, a big mine or a big bank or a big health insurer, and you see in the in the policy bills coming down the pipeline, prospective mass redistribution of your wealth and of your uh, commercial power, commercial interest away from you and into the government hands, you might be tempted to think that the best way to avoid uh, harsh implementation or harsher language is to is to get under the arm of the bully and say, whisper nice things into his ear and say, you know, don't you like me? If you are going to go after anyone, go after someone else. And that sort of uh, seemed to make the most sense to me, especially when expropriation without compensation was being tabled because the 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 business sector that had done the poorest job of finding itself on the right side of government, at least from a an ideological perspective, was big agriculture. And immediately once we saw expropriation without compensation tabled, you saw the main agricultural representatives of big business try and cozy up to government and say, oh, this is actually maybe not such a bad idea. Maybe we can make this work. Let's hold hands and we can go forward. And eventually that uh, didn't sit well with their with their membership. And, and that's the missing link. The real missing link is heads of corporations, top uh, procurement managers, uh, top consultants, they will all turn against government and bet on the policies that will grow South Africa and criticize the policies that keep South Africa stagnating and shrinking if they feel pressure from underneath. And of that, we've seen much too little. The representatives of the ordinary person, the man on the street kind of journalist uh, pundit uh, buys into the government's line out of naivete, I think, as much as knavery. And, uh, and, and the rest of us, I think, are are just out of the habit of 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 concentrated focused and uh, and galvanized criticism and so we find our interests poorly represented in the public square and uh, and and yeah the rest is the rest is the reality that we see in a, a fiscally bare cupboard uh, debt payments just servicing our debt we, we we borrow more than 2 billion a day just servicing our debt is going to cost more than a billion a day 5% of GDP. We were having a bit of a debate uh, with France about what the real GDP uh, to government expenditure ratio is. And I realized one of the lower figures that Mbueni was banding about was excluding debt servicing costs. When your debt servicing cost is 5% of GDP, you hit a universe that uh, hasn't happened many times before, but every time it has, it's... Uh, it's ended in a very ugly way, both either for those in charge or for the public or for both. Very uh, concerning indeed. It does feel like we are sort of well into the kind of debt death spiral uh, there, um, which uh, uh, is 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 not a nice place to be. But anyway, uh, France, do you have anything to add to to Gabriel's thoughts there? Because um, as we we start to wrap up, yeah. Here's the thing. Maybe you do a whole show on it tax and black tax and South Africa. 
because that's been missed in this debate as well. When I was doing those calculations about how much you actually pay in tax to get to this sort of 60% figure, one of the things that, that I'm still trying to get my head around is how do you factor black tax into that? Now, black tax is a phenomena of where you're in a very poor community. If you earn an income, many people around you don't, you kind of have this responsibility to carry the people around you. A lot of South Africa's first generation uh, black middle class so have this. It's a terrible pressure to be under. Because if you sort of say no, you're kind of telling people, well, screw you. You go back to poverty. I'll live a comfortable middle-class life. And if you're a nice person, you can't do that. It's, of course, not a phenomenon restricted to black people. A poor a white community see the same thing. We also think, I was speaking to an economist, a mate this morning, that we are seeing this black tax phenomenon start to creep into the white middle class as a, as a consequence of the uh, economic state of the country. And I think that needs to be factored into this because every job that's lost in South Africa predominantly affects black people because the unemployment figures are vast amongst black South Africans. Uh, uh, every, every, when social welfare grants are adjusted at a rate lower than inflation, I think the real black tax burden raise, rises as well. And something the government and left-wing activists have done quite well, but we're going to put a stop to it, I think we're going to start doing that uh, formally next week, is to kind of play this tax thing off as a white and black thing. That, you know, whites are... And Bowen, he said before the budget that whites are racist. I mean, it's an amazing statement to have the confidence to make. These are your taxpayers whose money you're, you're taking and doling out and claiming the credit for. And some some of that money, lots of it. Um, this, 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 and, and I think under pressure, the government and activists on the left are going to respond to criticism of the budget by saying, oh, it's racist because you don't want more tax to be paid or wealth taxes because you're protecting white capital. There's some complete moron wrote that in, I think, News 24 this morning or somewhere like that. Uh, it would have been a moron in News 24, but maybe not the one we're thinking of. The, um, the, <laughs> the point is this, that... Black South Africans, you can make the case, not to the exception of whites, are particularly heavily punished by what the minister said yesterday. And the white South Africans too, of course. And if you want to break out of this, we need to break out of this, this, this sort of pathetic South African state where if there's a national crisis, we chop it up into racial categories and we argue about which race uh, uh, suffers the crisis in, in worse ways than another race. We do this with murder. Blacks or whites murdered more. And then the side that's murdered the least or the most becomes the winner or the loser. When we, you know, you're all dead at the end. It's a very serious problem. And I, I actually think there's potential in, in this and the general frustration in the public, the, the trade unions, uh, the EFF's obviously got to read on it. Those are sharp political chaps. I mean, they know when there's a political gap. And I think it would be a very positive thing if, if, if the, the collective extent, to a lesser or greater extent, that black and white South Africans are both victims of what's really citizen abuse now. That's a term we're going to start using next week. Actually realize that squabbling with each other about who gets the most abused is pointless. We've got a collective interest here in setting this right. The South African government is extracting wealth out of the hard work of people and the Black, white, rich, poor. Remember the poor pay tax, they pay VAT. That's a big part of, 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 of the overall tax take. We've got a collective interest here in actually coming together and saying, you know, we, we suffer this thing together. We need to stand up for it together. Because what's missing in all of this, why this kind of nonsense uh, is pulled off, why, why Tito Mboweni gets away with it, why Ramaphosa gets away with it, before you even speak of Zuma and Ace Mahashula that, that openly steal the tax that's paid, why, why they get away with it is that your taxpayers aren't politically organized. They're a disparate group. Business is never going to do it. They would They'll take their lead from what they think the ANC will approve. So they're not going to come to the rescue of the country or this. If you can organize taxpayers politically, black, white, together, you'll put an end to this nonsense, this wastage, and this corruption. And you said it's all terrible, Nick, in a hole, and it is bad. But, you know, I'm, again, not the 
you know, my, my, I've got a conservative reputation, which is useful when I say things like this, that this is not all bad, because when governments run out of money, they tend to also run out of power. And what's happening in this deficit is we're opening a window where if we play the cards correctly as a country and as the people and the citizens, which is the end all that, that we who sit here are, we're just citizens on YouTube. If you play that correctly, I think you can create a window to, to turn the politics around and put an end to this abuse of, of people who work so hard in the country. Nick. Indeed. Uh, so now is as good a time as any to get together, everyone, and put a stake through the heart of the vampire state, um, because <laughs> otherwise it's going to suck us dry. Um, uh, Gabriel, I don't know if you have anything to add in sort of 30 seconds or so. Uh, yeah, just one thing. If you, if you at any point in listening to this worried that we were being overly critical, I challenge you to go and watch on YouTube Tito Mbaweni deliver the speech and watch when he promises that there will be a budget surplus by 2024. He himself cannot keep a straight face when he says it. He smiles and he laughs and he looks out of the corner of his eye for the very good reason that he knows he's in a circus and he's just the chief clown. Right. Very good advice. I'd also like to recommend um, uh, the, the, the public submissions on the Nation Without Compensation Bill uh, closes this Sunday, I believe. Please go to our website, ira.org.za, click the campaigns button at the top of the screen and go to the Stop Expropriation, Protect Property Rights, sign, sign our submission. Um, we need to get those all in to try and slow down the process of expropriation without compensation. As we've talked about on the show, it will be devastating for the economy. And so everything we can do to slow it down, gum it up or, or challenge it is a very good thing to do. Um, all right. Thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you very much for watching us. We will be back next week for another edition of the Daily Friend Show. Thank you very much, everyone. And keep the flag of liberty flying.